Kevin Clarkson here. I want to tell you about a great deal for our friends and family of Prophecy in the News. We recently had our Pikes Peak Prophecy Summit. We had an incredible lineup of speakers and guests. The attendees were so excited. We heard many comments this was the best prophecy conference ever. If you didn't make it, not to despair. We're offering live streaming still through August the 17th. And by paying uh, $49.95, you have access to the live stream of all the material in the main room. We had such great speakers. We had a special message from Chuck Missler about the decline of America. We had a message from uh, Bill Federer about the rising Arab Spring. We had messages from Dan Goodwin about the timing and, and the sense of the barley harvest and the Lord's return. Messages from Anthony Patch, a new face, about what's happening uh, really in physics today that shows spiritual reality. Get on board. Get with us. Sign up for live streaming. Call the 800 number on your screen or go to prophecyofthenews.com. Thank you. Welcome to Prophecy in the News. I'm your host, Kevin Clarkson. We're talking today about the miracle of Israel. This is part two of uh, two shows on what God's done with the nation of Israel. Our guest is our good friend, Gary Frazier. Gary's pastor, evangelist, uh, Holy Land traveler, uh, writer, lots of good things. Former pastor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it's always great to be with you, Kevin. Thanks so much for having me. Well, it's good to have you. Uh, I might just jump right back in if I can. You know, sure. as we spoke last time about Israel, we were looking at the past and how so much of our Bible, our Holy Bible, is an Old and a New Testament or covenant. And that Old Covenant was God preparing the world for Christ. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And one of the things that we're the reason we're talking about this book, obviously, is my newest book has just come out, uh, Miracle of Israel. And as we said in our last program, when writing the book, you know, we wanted to break it down into three parts, past and then present and future. And the last time we were together, we talked about the past and laid the groundwork really for God's eternal plan for the ages. Right. It started in the book of Genesis with a covenant relationship uh, with these descendants of Isaac that come through the line of Abram and uh, Abraham, and how God will continue that plan. And he's certainly not through with the nation of Israel. He's not through with the Jewish people. And they have an incredible history. We subtitled the book, The, the Untold Story of God's Love for His People, because the truth is today, mm. so many churches really never talk about Israel. And no, they, they really don't, don't <coughs> teach how important uh, Israel is today and the role that they still play. They don't even the teach about really end time events at all. It's, yeah. uh, it's more um, practical 17 steps to love your mother in law <laughs> and how to give your dog a Christian shampoo. You know, <laughs> I, I'm being silly, but I mean, well, I you know, we really have gone yeah. off the reservation in some ways. And we, we really need have. to get back to the Word I of agree. God. Couldn't agree more. And I will tell you that one of the reasons why that's so vital is that first of all, we have a responsibility to this generation to engage them with biblical truth. And that, that truth is not just John 3, 16. Right. That truth is Genesis through Revelation, is the entire word of the living God. And so as we study, we need to begin to remember that, that about half of the Bible, 50% of that is, was history. Right. And when God records history, it's, it's always accurate. 25% uh, of the Bible, roughly, is how we should live our lives on a day-by-day -day basis. You know, he, God gives us the direction yes. for our lives. And then about a quarter of the Bible is prophecy at the time that it was written. And, and you cannot understand what God is doing in the world today without recognizing the value and the role that Israel plays in end-time prophecy. But the question is, you know, how did we get to where we are? If we believe, and as I do, and I think you, and I share this same belief, that we're the terminal generation. How did we get here? Well, it certainly didn't happen overnight. It no, was it not didn't. instantaneous. The light switch wasn't just flipped on. We went from darkness to daylight. There was a process. There was a plan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Before the foundation of the world, there was a plan in place. Yeah, and, which is still a mind. When you say that, uh -huh. my, it just boggles my mind every time that I think about that. You know, well, our, go <coughs> our God is so great. Yeah. So vast and so wonderful. Yeah, and, and you know, you hear the secular world today trying to convince us that we are here as a result of chance and, uh, it, it, you know, over time. I mean, seriously? Seriously. I, I, I just look at people and I say, really? I, With a straight I, face, can you, you say that? You are an intelligent human being. There's no possible way the evidence of the Creator is, is so powerful and overwhelming if we would just be intellectually honest to examine the facts. And that's why... Israel is so important 
because the fact that they exist just verifies uh, the fact that there's a creator. Their preservation through the ages, you know. There's an anecdotal story of a medieval king, and uh, he had a court jester who he kind of made fun of. But one day the king was being a little bit king philosopher, and he, he said to the jester, he said, well, prove God to me in two words. And the jester looked back at him and said, the Jew. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah D.L. Moody, the great evangelist, would later pick up on that. Uh, and and mention that as well when someone in a in a crowd that he was speaking to one uh-huh. night hollered out and said, "Prove to us that there is a God." And he said, "The Jews." He copied that because that is so true. Preserved they, through the centuries. Absolutely. And 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 by the way, there has never been a group of people targeted for extinction like the Jews. Oh my! And who have survived? Talk about a target on your back. Absolutely. And it's growing by the hour as we're doing the program right now. It, it really is. It's sad. To, it, uh, it agrees me as it does you and our, many of our viewers to, under, to, to think and talk about this. But the truth of the matter is the whole world is turning against Israel. We, we recently celebrated the Holocaust remembrance yeah. here and around the world. Right. And, you know, the theme coming out of the camps at Auschwitz and all was never again. Yeah. And yet we are coming back to that again. Anti-Semitism is on the rise in Europe and in America. Uh, many of these political rallies that are going on, there's uh, anti-Semitic signs. Totally. The Occupy Wall Street movement. Yeah. Uh, what's spiritually behind that, Gary? Well, it's, 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 it's satanically driven. I mean, let's just be frank. Uh, Satan hates the Jews because it was through the Jews the Messiah was going to come. He lost that battle. Now he hates the Jews because it is through the Jews that the, that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come again. And so it's a constant conflict that has been raging through the ages and started in the old testament it's continued throughout time and we need to recognize that but woe unto those who come against the chosen people of god i will tell you the dustbins of history are full of the nations that have turned their backs upon and aggressively tried to persecute the jews and you know the truth is is that you won't find the parasites and the uh, rephazites and all those all that all the ites they're yeah. long gone, but Israel, the Jewish people, the Jewish nation has survived. Why? Because God has an ultimate plan that, and they are a vital link to that. But before we talk too much about that, yeah. let me take a moment, if I may, please, and share a little bit about the process. Yeah, now, scroll for through me, that. this is the this is the exciting part yeah, of the story. I believe it's it. all exciting, but I got to tell you, I had so much fun writing this book because you know this book is kind of the it's kind of a culmination of of all these numerous, so well over a hundred trips that I've been to Israel since 1971, and just the things that I've learned, the things that I've experienced there. But but I was reminded again, and I wanted to tell the story uh, about how God began that process. You know, here the Jews are; they're scattered into all the world, sold into the slave markets of the world by the Romans. And in 135 A.D., of course, Israel is lost as far as a national entity; the name disappears. Because Hadrian, the Roman emperor, would change the name of Israel to Syria, Palestinia, because the Philistines were the arch enemy of the Jews, and it was such an insult to the Jewish people when he did that. So you're making uh, the link between the word Palestine and Philistine. Absolutely. Exactly. By Hadrian. And, uh, and so, by <coughs> the way, uh, just on a side note, uh, we added an appendix to the book that deals with Palestine and the name, where it came from, uh-huh. how it's been misapplied and misused and so forth. And maybe we'll talk about that in a minute, but that's one of the appendices. There really was in no modern people or nation of Palestine. I'm sure never, that's where that's going. Never in the history of the world. No, they're, they're Arabic peoples that are descendants of Ishmael that, that could not enter into other Arabic nations. They, well, they yes. were closed and sort of left there in, in the land, the Holy Land. And one of the interesting things is, uh, is, Kevin, that the Philistines as a people had vanished long they're before gone. the first century when, when, when Hadrian changed their name. Today, we're being told by these quote-unquote people who have come up from the peninsula of Saudi Arabia about two or three hundred years ago or so or less tried to say, well, this land has belonged to us because we're the descendants of the Philistines. They're not. They're not at all related to that. And by the way, we will talk about this more in a moment. But everyone who lived in the land from the time of 135 A.D. onward were just simply referred to as Palestine, right. Palestinians. Rather. And it doesn't matter. A, a mixed bag. It didn't matter whether they were Jews. It doesn't, it doesn't make any difference. They were, everybody was called a Palestinian because it the land. It wasn't ethnic. It was just they were in that that's area. Right. It was a geographical assimilation yeah. because of the name of the land. Grab bag. But that said, to fast forward, keep in mind, for some, from 70 A.D. onward now, Israel, you know, the Jews are out of the land. And 
there's always been a small contingent, but by and large, most of the land is empty and void of Jews. Now right. that said, uh, God begins that process ever so slowly. And we find that in the year 1517, of course, now think about it. They've been gone now for almost 1500 years. Uh, the Ottoman Turkish empire begins to rule uh-huh. and they would stay there till 1917. But during that process, God slowly, slowly begins to work. So what does he do? 1878, a vision to a Russian born Jew in a barn outside Paris concerning the rebirth of the Hebrew language. When he appeared to in a dream or gave Eliezer Ben Yehuda a dream about this language. Fast forward 1897, a Jewish fella born in Budapest moved to Vienna, a playwright, a reporter. Lo- he loved to write, but he's an atheist by and large, uh, actually baptized as a Christian, but not in a believing sense. Uh, just an attempt to try to assimilate uh-huh. with culture. And many Jews did that, by the way. But that said, realized because he had been, he'd been given an assignment to go to Paris to cover the trial, a trial that involved treason of a Jewish soldier that was in the French military. It was the famous Dreyfus uh-huh. trial. And during that time, uh, Theodore Herzl came to understand they're going to convict this guy, but not based on evidence, only because he's a Jew. And yeah. there'll never be a place where the Jews will be safe if they don't have their own land. Well, the problem was he was trying to f- work through the, all the ideas. Well, where could you go? Because the Ottoman Turkish Empire controlled the, the land. So in 1897 in Basel, Switzerland, he convened the first what we call the Zion Conference. Zionist referring, of course, obviously, or Zionism referring to Israel. Right. This was not a religious movement. It was not because of what God promised or anything else. It was purely a pragmatic decision because the Jewish people. people, Exactly. To preserve the Jewish people. And so the end result of that was, was they came up with uh, a national anthem called the Hatikva, which means the hope. They had developed the flag, the broad blue stripes and the Star of David and so forth and so on. And the thrust of that was to reignite the desire in the hearts of Jews to return to the land. Because, by the way, think about it. Yeah. They had been separated from their land for all of these centuries. I mean, we had Russian-born Jews. You had uh, British uh, Jews, Italian Jews, French Jews, German Jews. And they had homes and all that. Now, there was another contributing factor, and that was, was that the, the situation in Russia was deteriorating and the Jews were being severely attacked there. And so there was a strong desire to try to help those Jews get out of Russia. But where would they go? Where would they? And they were some of the first ones back, weren't they? They, they were. were. In large numbers. That's right. Yeah. And so uh, out of the first Zionist conference, and there were several that followed that, but the idea was, and Herzl would write in his diary, he said, today we have created the modern state of Israel. Maybe not in five years, but most certainly within 50 years. And little did he know how prophetic that statement was. But, but I pause for a moment to say this. The interesting thing is, is that God used an atheist to start the process to <laughs> fulfill the, the prophecies of the ancient prophets contained in the scripture. You got to love God's sense of humor, <laughs> don't you? <laughs> I mean, you know, of all the people on the earth to pick, he picks an atheist yeah. uh, who had, for all intents and purposes, been baptized even as a Christian, as I said, only for assimilation purposes. To, yeah. yeah. And, and here we go. And he's, he's off and moving now. Fast forward to that. We get into World War I, and obviously uh, uh, at the end of World War I, of course, the Allied forces defeat the Ottoman Turks and the Germans. And so all of a sudden that land is liberated, that land called Palestine. And it would begin under the British mandate in 1917 that would finally climax in 1948 on May 14th when Israel became a nation. But the British, while they started out friendly toward the Jews, over time began to be a little bit more hostile they toward did. the Jews. A lot of animosity between them because the Britain, the Brits were trying to do more seemingly to help the, the Palestinian Muslims than they were the Palestinian Jews. Right. And it's interesting. Uh, I just watched again a couple nights ago the story of the Exodus where the, these Jews were on that ship and so forth, nowhere to go. It was a, you know, quite a sad, sad story. But having said that, God was at work. And during World War I, the British had a problem. They needed acetone, a key ingredient in the production of gunpowder as they were fighting against the Germans. And they simply had no access. They couldn't get a hold of it. And a, a Jewish scientist by the name of Heim Weizmann found a way to create uh, acetone in the, la- in, the, in the laboratory. 
Okay. And because he was able to produce, they were working 24-7 producing acetone. And when the war came to an end, they said, what can we do for you? He said, I don't want you to do anything for me. I want you to recognize that my people deserve their land back. And so November 2nd, 1917, the acclaimed Balfour Declaration was written. And for the first time, a major nation in the world <coughs> recognized that the Jews had a right to their land because basically the Balfour Declaration said the, the, the king, the majesty, would look with favor upon the establishment of, of a homeland for the Jewish people in their traditional land. Right. Which meaning Israel. And it put it in motion. That's right. And I think you're going to take kick us. kick the ball down the road a I'm little I'm going to anticipate you, but I think you're going to take us to the fact that, you know, World War II is going to bring them home when that's over. Mm -hmm. But it took two global wars and the net result's a recreation of Israel. Absolutely. And, you, and that's true because in those years between 1917 and actually starting in, in around 1937, as the J Jewish people, as Adolf Hitler came to power, the Jewish people began once again to become the scapegoat for everything bad in the world and ultimately the death camps of Germany. And out of the ashes of the Holocaust, of course, then God makes it, the, the, prepares the world that it's time for the Jews to have a homeland. And I love this passage of scripture. Uh, we were talking about that a few moments ago before we went on the air, but I want to uh, take a moment and read this because in Isaiah 49, uh, God speaks to the prophet <coughs> and, and he actually says this in verse 22. This is what the sovereign Lord says. See, now keep in mind the setting here his, chronologically is about 700 years before Jesus. And so at this point, see, I will beckon to the Gentiles I will lift up my banner to the peoples. They, the Gentiles, will bring your sons in their arms and carry uh -huh. your daughters on their soldiers, on their shoulders. Uh -huh. Now, when our then uh, commander in chief, Dwight D. Eisenhower, uh, made that first journey into the concentration camps, these death camps across Europe, uh, he had all of that photograph because he said there'll come a time when the world will not believe that this happened and they need to, we need to have a record of this. And we would have said unbelievable, but it's happening. That's right. We would have never thought that people would deny the Holocaust. Uh, today, and Holocaust yet, deniers. And, and today, that's a fairly prominent position by much of the world. But that said, God was so specific. We, he said the Gentiles, they will bring your sons in their arms. Well, what happened in those death camps? They were those who survived were so weak uh, for lack of basic essentials, food and so forth. Nourishment. And they were just on the verge of death themselves. They virtually picked them up. Soldiers, our United States and British soldiers, picked them up in their arms and carried them. them out of those death camps. Uh, and and it's just amazing how literally the word of God ends up being fulfilled. Well, uh, the cry of the world was that it's time for the nation of Israel to have their homeland. The problem was, was that we had the British occupation. We had a large Muslim population that was uh, pretty aggressively opposed to Israel's existence. And yet the United Nations declares by UN decree that there's a partition of the land that Israel has from the Mediterranean to the old city of Jerusalem. And the rest of that belongs to the Jordanians under what was called Transjordan. And yet God was mm -hmm. not finished because all of that, up to and including the old city of Jerusalem, ultimately belonged to the Jewish people all the way to the, Medi to the, to the Jordan River. So what was God going to do? Well, he began to work in history, to work in the affairs of nations. And what was so interesting is, is that he even worked in the affairs of the presidents of the United States. Let me give you a quick little uh -huh. story. And I know that you know this, but maybe some of our viewers do not. As most of our most Americans know today that we only had one president in our history that served four terms in office, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Right. And uh, so as Roosevelt took us through World War II and people loved the fireside chats when the president would sit down and just basically talk honestly to the American people about what was going on, what we needed to do, how we needed to be supportive, and how, by the way, and how we needed to pray uh -huh. that, that, that we would win, that we'd be the victor in this situation. Bottom line is, is that in the run-up to that fourth election, he had a presidential, a vice presidential candidate that he barely knew, didn't much care for, uh, and his name was Harry S. Truman. 
And Harry Truman was a Baptist, a Christian, a follower of Christ. But what's interesting is God knew that Truman, that the president of the United States during this particular time would need knowledge of the prophecies concerning the nation of Israel. So many years ago, prior to that, when Truman was a young man, he was in business with a Jewish man by the name of Eddie Jacobson, who taught him all these great prophecies concerning uh, Israel and how God was going to bring them back, put them in their land and so forth and so on. And why? And so all of a sudden now, April 12th, 1945, Roosevelt dies. Truman finds himself as a president. And so 45 to 48, God put him there, the right person, right place, right time to make the right decision because ultimately there was going to be a showdown over whether or not the United States of America was going to support the Jewish right to their land. And so God set the stage. He brings Harry Truman to be the person, gave him the background, the biblical comprehension, understanding. By the way, most people in, in 1945, if you didn't live in Miami or New York or maybe Los Angeles, you probably didn't know a Jewish person. And so now God allows him to know what the scripture says concerning Israel's right to exist in their land. So May 14th comes along, 1948. All of <coughs> Harry Truman's staff, all of his advisors say, don't have anything to do with this. And yet at 4 p.m. on that afternoon, David Ben-Gurion reads the Declaration of Independence. Uh-huh. <laughs> 11 minutes later, Harry Truman recognizes the nation of Israel, the government as being the de facto leadership or a representative of the Jewish people. And Israel is born. That's the hand of God. Absolutely. And, and what's amazing is, is that, you see, today many of our viewers may get the impression sometimes that we're living or that they're living in kind of a vacuum. Things are just happening. Oh and uh, you know, we don't know where the world's going. It's crazy. I don't, know what, I don't know what to think. I don't know what to do. I'm so anxious, you know. We need to step back and say, wait a minute, time out. God has and is working in history, and therefore we just need to rest in him Amen. and trust him. <coughs> And the restoration of Israel is the great sign. And uh, let me just tell folks how they can learn more about this through the book. Uh, We're talking to Gary Frazier today. Uh, His newest book, The Miracle of Israel, uh, co-authored with Jim Fletcher, another friend of our ministry. This is available for $13.99. It's uh, got a lot of great information, uh, photos in here, historic uh, information, confirmations of scripture. It'll be a great, great bolstering strength to your faith. You can use it really to share with friends that don't know about this at all. But uh, $13.99 plus shipping and handling. And as always, you call the 800 number on your screen or go to prophecyinthenews.com on our website. And Gary, you say you have an audio version forthcoming and so folks can watch for details as that's available. Yeah, and you know, Kevin, let me just say to our, our viewers, this is an easy read. Yes. This it is, looks I, did, fun. I did not write this for theologians. Yeah, it's I not a this. big, heavy, That's scholarly. Right. I wanted to make it interesting, exciting. I wanted to try to convey my heart, my passion in this book. And the and, hand of God. And, and that's and I had some and that's why I say I had fun writing the book, because this was this was not a labor of love. It was just an enjoyable experience. And people that have read it so far have come back and said, you know, it's just it's an easier. It's only about 200 pages. Right. By the way. Right. And it's just an easy read, but it's loaded with information and wonderful stories that people can, we've done an interesting thing in the book. We put interesting facts, kind of along many things, things that people didn't know. Like, for example, example, what did Mark Twain observe when he made his journey to to that part of the world in 1867 and how he described the barrenness of the land? And yet it's God's prophets who said, when the Jewish people, Uh when the people of God are out of the land, the land of milk and honey only brings forth thorns and thistles. Uh And it did. It did. And that's why... Uh, but now the rose blooms in the desert yeah, today. And, yeah, and so Mark Twain writes about this. He said, this is an ugly place. It is desolate. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he, he, wa- he was so uh, you know, shocked at how forlorn that place was and would write about it in his classic, The Innocence Abroad. <clears throat> that said, we try to highlight a lot of those interesting facts in the book. Uh, further to that, we talk a lot about, um, there's a, there's, by, and by the way, I would just say that I mentioned in the book a wonderful documentary. It's called Above and Beyond. Uh-huh. And it's interesting that it was produced by Steven Spielberg's sister, Nancy. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, it's the story about how American pilots, uh, v- after the end of World War II, <coughs> excuse me. It's all right. <coughs> when uh, when uh, 
Israel was about to engage in the War of Independence, how American pilots went to help Israel, how they fought for the Jews. Amazing. And uh, that's a Jewish <laughs> family, and they even have a special tree, I believe, at the Holocaust Museum, the Spielbergs. Uh, of course, he made Schindler's List, the movie that mm-hmm. acquainted so many people. And, you know, Gary, I, I, I know a book like this can't cover everything, but uh, we, we see the Holocaust, God bringing good out of bad, as horrible as that was, that fueled a lot of the mass migration back to Israel by the Jewish people. Absolutely. I mean, we could have gotten these deeds signed. We could have gotten these laws passed through the UN. But uh, if there wasn't a market for anybody to want to go back to this desolate land, nothing would have happened. But because of the persecution and anti-Semitism, there was this mass uh, return to the land. And isn't that happening again today in Europe? It is. In fact, uh, recently, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu said it's time for the Jews to come home. Oh, boy. That means it's time for Jesus to come back. Absolutely. Uh, Folks, the days are short. And uh, we've been enjoying visiting with Gary Frazier today about the miracle of Israel. Uh, I want to say again at this point, uh, do you say, do you folks just have a love affair with Israel? Well, we do because they're the people of God. They're the chosen people. But our love affairs with Jesus. Uh, Israel was selected to prepare the world for the scriptures, for the coming of the Messiah, to be the witness to the true God. And Israel itself means prince of God. And they are the prince of nations. They are the ones that are to point the way. And even though they've lost it themselves, when they rejected Christ, God did not cast them aside forever. This is an unconditional covenant. It is. And I, and I would just simply say to our viewers, as we kind of wrap this program up, that, that God is not finished with Israel. The reason they exist today is because God brought them back, put them in their land in order to finish his end time business with the nation of Israel, the Jewish people, and by the way, the Gentiles as well. Uh, Israel has experienced some terrible times in their history. But unfortunately... During the, seven, the coming seven-year tribulation period, uh, they are going to experience great horrors once again, as Zechariah chapter 13, verse 8 tells us, that two-thirds of the Jews living in the land of Israel are going to perish. The time of Jacob's sorrow. Absolutely, during that tribulation time. And I, that really motivates us to, be, to, to not just love the Jewish people, but love them enough to share Yeshua HaMashiach, the Messiah. Amen. Jesus is the way, the truth, and life. And no man comes to the Father but by him. And the good news, Kevin, coming out of Israel is, is that we're seeing lots and lots of Jewish people come to true saving faith in Christ. And for that, we rejoice because the hour is late. Jesus is coming soon, and we have to be about his business. Amen. And I'm told uh, by those that uh, work in these areas that more Jewish people are coming to faith than ever before. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to be a Jewish person to come to faith. Jesus is the Savior of the world. Call on him and be saved. Keep looking up.